Okay, so um, I think that's three o'clock. So um, this virtual tutorial is about um, it's mostly about um, just an introduction to Luster and uh, some tips on how to tune your I.O. Um, I'm sure, uh, sorry, just before I start this, just to comment on uh, the material you can use, almost all this material apart from three slides which are uh, being provided by um, Cray. Uh, if you want to use the content of those slides, you'll have to uh, email the help desk and ask uh, Cray for permission to use those. So um, the slash work file system, which which you use uh, from the compute nodes in Archer, uh, is a Luster parallel file system uh, to give high performance uh, access to to the files from the compute nodes. Um, uh, a Luster file system it's it's made up of um, a sort of hierarchy of um, of of entities. One is first is the object storage target. That's a, a rated array of hard disk drives. So uh, that's so so the basic unit is a whole RAID array. So it's it's already at, at quite a high level. Um, and then there will be several of those OSTs in one object storage server. Um, so that's a, a computer which which handles uh, all those these um, these disk drives. And for each file system, there'll be a metadata server which handles the metadata. So things like the um, the permissions for files, the um, last access and modification times of files. Um, and so I'll, I'll, show, I'll show a picture of the of the um, arrangement for for Archer. Uh, and files are striped over the OSTs. I'll explain that in a couple of slides. Um, and we get the high performance mainly through accessing um, the files in parallel. Each of these files are separate on each OST, and since you have a, a number of OSTs and you can access them in parallel, you can increase your um, read-write bandwidth. So this is what Archer looks like. Uh, yes, we don't have an Archer um, logo on the front here, but this is more or less the same as the uh, Arch setup. Um, so these are the uh, uh, cabinets with the compute nodes. Uh, they're all all the compute nodes connected together with the the high speed network which you use in your in your parallel programs with with MPI message passing. And within those, there are some service nodes which have um, uh, LNet routers, which is lost the networking routers, which connect the uh, high speed network. That you use within the within Archer to an InfiniBand network, which connects is, connects Archer to um, all the Luster um, OSSs and the MDSs, which are not shown on this diagram. And there are also connections to the login nodes and the uh, serial nodes. So, so everything can everything in, in, in it, on Archer can access the the slash work file systems. And we have three file systems. Uh, they're mostly divided up um, depending on, uh, well, different projects will be on different file systems. Um, there's a, there are some arbitrariness in, in the distribution of these um, file systems. So for example, if we take um, FS2, there are 12 OSSs on that. Uh, each of those OSSs has four OSTs, and in total there are 480 hard disk drives, um, and the, the total amount is one and a half petabytes. So that gives me an overall idea of how it's connected. Um, the generally the you know the high speed network in the in Archer is fast, in Finibat it's fast, and and the disk drives are fast as well, and they're they're parallelized up. Um, so if you arrange your your um, your access to them well, then you can get very high bandwidths. So how's that done? So the way it's arranged is that if you can imagine a um, Elastic client, so your application, or, or more exactly the the node that your your application is running on, 
Um, imagine you have uh, a file, in this case, just eight megabytes long, and it's split up into one megabyte stripe. So this is this, as far as the as far as the um, user is concerned, this is just a, a logical um, splitting up. There's no the, the, when you when you read and write a file, if you're not using any um, uh, li libraries that exploit the parallelism of, of Lustre, then you wouldn't realize they were splitting this way. Um, the one megabyte stripes are the default for Archer um, for the Archer slash work file systems. Uh, you can change this. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but in this case, we'll just look at the default. So if you want to say you're you have this eight megabyte um, file. Sorry, this this view of an eight megabyte file, and you you say have this in your memory on a compute node. You want to write it out, and say you just have one process that you're you're using, and you write it out in this sequence here. You write the first, second, third. You just as normal, you would write them out into a file. Uh, in fact, what happens when you when this is translated into the distribution over the OSTs is um, the striping here, the default stripe is the default number of stripes is to have four stripes. So the first megabyte will be um, on this OST here, and the, say, the four, uh, one, two, three, the fifth um, megabyte will also be on that OST. So you can see how they're striped. Um, the access to each part of this file. Um, will be to a different OST. So if you're writing, if if you're uh, writing out this file, even if you're doing just a serial write, so you, this is one process, um, you will you can write out this meg, this first part of this this stripe of this file out to this OST, and this OST can be writing to disk, which is relatively slow. At the same time as you have, you are writing out the second megabyte to this OST, which is writing out, etc. So you can get some parallelism already um, from a single process um, writing out. And as you can imagine, if you have multiple processes and you have them arranged uh, carefully, you can get uh, each process writing out to a different OST. So that's the idea of striping, um, and as I said, the default is to have one megabyte stripe and four stripes, four uh, a count of four stripes. So you'll be striping over four OSTs, and also the default is that you let the um, system decide which OSTs to stripe over. Um, there's really much point in you choosing a particular set of OST, well, a start OST. So what can you do? To tune Luster, um, so you've given just a very brief overview of what it looks like, um, most of the uh, settings and tunings are either fixed by Luster um, uh, itself or have been tuned by Cray um, on the Luster file system itself. But there are still a couple of um, settings that you can change. Uh, which can help um, improve the performance of access to and from Luster. Um, and in addition, there are some there are some uh, programming libraries which you can use to uh, improve further the parallel the parallelism you can get to Luster. I'm not going to talk about those much, or in fact, in any detail at all uh, in this uh, talk. I'll just mention a few um, references to URLs at the end. So, what do you want to tune? The, 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 basic, the basic thing you can tune is how you stripe the, the files. Um, uh, the common commands are LFS, get stripe, and LFS, set stripe. So, the LFS is a command which you use to access some um, utilities to um, set or, or uh, view parameters that um, are used for, for LFS. Um, and if you do LFS help, you can see uh, a whole load of other commands. Some of them aren't very, some of them aren't useful to an ordinary user, um, and 
quite a few of them are just informative, so you can find out, for instance, how many OSTs there are um, on your particular file system. So what does get Stripe do? Well, as you can imagine, it, it tells you a, a bit of information about the stripe, um, the striping of your file. So the, the example here is we've done LFS get stripe on a, uh, a directory that uh, was created with just with the default striping. So we've just done make dir default stripe dir. You can see that the stripe count is four, which is the default. The stripe size is one megabyte, and the stripe offset is minus one, which is just use the default, which um, in our case is just let the Luster system choose the, um, or, excuse me, OSTs that are um, um, used to stripe over. And within this directory, there is one file called my file, and this has uh, a bit more information about its striping. So again, it's stripe four. The stripe size is one. I'm not sure what those others two are, um, but you can see that the uh, the file is striped over four OSTs, 15, 7, 23, and 40, and the, the choices have been made by the, the Loster um, system. So what can you do to change this? And um, we'll come on to what things will be sensible to change it to. Uh, you use the command LFS set stripe, which will set the striping information. So for example, uh, in this, for this, uh, this command here, LFS set stripe minus C1, and then the file name will set the striping count to one. So that means that that file would just be put onto a single OST. So that would be much like having um, a file on the slash home file system. Um, when you do get stripe, you find that the count has changed to one. The stripe size is the same. Stripe off is the same. Um, the important thing is to note, I think, uh, yeah, if you, you can set the stripe count on a directory itself. Uh, the advantage of that is that any files and subdirectories you create will inherit the uh, parent's stripe settings. So that means you don't have to go through all your files and set the stripes and then, and then create the file. Uh, you can set the stripe in a directory and then everything underneath that will have the same striping. Which is an advantage if you if you know that you have um, you you want a particular stripe size for all your files. Uh, the disadvantage is if you have a variety of um, file sizes. It's mainly uh, and you want to have different file stripes file striping. Um, but yeah, you would usually have a, a default which uh, reflects most of the the files in your in your directory. The point about striping, though, is that you can't change the file striping once it's been created. Um, you, you, uh, so in this case, uh, this my file has been already created, and uh, the stripe count, the attempt is being made to, to change the stripe count to the maximum, um, and you get this error. If you want to change the um, striping, you will have to. Well, there are several ways to do it, but the simplest way is to make a new directory with the desired size, size and then copy that, copy the file into that directory. Moving it will not make any difference. So if you have, if you have a file which is stripe size 4 and you have created a directory with stripe size 1 and you just move your files, they will retain the, 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 old, file, uh, the old stripe size and stripe count. Um, and in this command, we've used uh, set stripe minus C for the count, and you use minus one, which just means use the maximum possible. Uh, so if you recall the, the slide at the beginning of the talk, uh, depending on the file system, the maximum will be 48 or 56 OSTs. 
So what, what do you need to know about Luster to, to make a good choice of stripe counts and stripe sizes? Um, the point about Luster is that it, it's designed to deliver high bandwidth um, to, well, a small number of files and, and usually large, um, large files and not very many of them. So this would be things like if you, if you were running a, a large simulation and you had a restart file um, or, or large input files, uh, large output files. It's not designed to work with the large numbers of small files. Um, there are, well, there are, there are um, various aspects to this. One is that uh, if you have lots and lots of files in, in a directory, then you get, um, you can have bottlenecks at the metadata server. So if you're doing, you, you probably notice it yourself sometimes if you've got a, um, if you have a, a directory on slash work with, with thousands of files in it and you do ls minus l, you sit for maybe half a minute waiting for the, the results to come back. And that's because um, each one of those, uh, each, each one of those um, entries in that listing for ls minus l has to access the metadata server, get some information about the, um, the file, and then return that. Also, if you have, um, especially if you have your file striped over many OSTs, uh, some file information has to be got from the OST. So the file size information is stored in the OSTs. So if you're doing ls minus l, you're not only looking at the, the metadata server, you're also having to um, query many OSTs as well. Um, and the other point, which is not really a, uh, well, it, it's, I suppose, concerned with tuning uh, the, the stripe size, that Luster is not um, impervious to failure. So if, if one OST is lost, then it means all the files using that OST uh, are inaccessible. So if you, have a, if, if, you had, if you had your file striped over many OSTs, or say you had striped over all the OSTs, then if one of them um, is lost, one of the OSTs is lost, then you've lost part of your file, and it is difficult to recover from that. Um, and when I say lost, I mean, because these are RAID, uh, the, the OSTs are RAID arrays underneath, then we would expect that you wouldn't, if just one disk fails, that's not catastrophic, but if you had many disks failing, then that would be catastrophic. So the thing to note and the thing we emphasize always is that work is not backed up. So it's useful. F it, it, we don't uh, delete it. We don't delete files in a, uh, in a rolling 30-day um, cycle or anything. They are left there, but you have to be aware it's not backed up. So when you've completed your simulations, um, then put the important uh, data somewhere else. So, with those warnings, how do you choose a good stripe count? So the default striping on Arch is four. So that's it's it's not going to be optimal for all cases. It's it's chosen um, for typical uh, sizes of files and the typical access patterns of um, of people running on on Cree XE thirties. Um, but your Particular simulations may have may work uh, faster with with different strap settings. Uh, two examples are well, two extremes really are. Um, you could have one file written by multiple processes. So you again say you have at the end of your simulation you have uh, a restart file of, of um, tens of gigabytes, um, and you have arranged your uh, um, and and your your application uses something like MPIO or NetCDF with um, uh, parallel NetCDF. Um, in that case, you want to set the striping to maximum using LFS set stripe minus C minus one. Um, and that means that the 
files spread over OS, all OSTs, you can get maximum um, parallelism and you can get maximum um, bandwidth to and from the file. The other extreme, which is not, it, sorry, it can be efficient. It can be um, efficient, but uh, it's not recommended if you have a large number of processes, is you could have one file per process and you have the number of processes greater than the number of OSTs generally. So that would be more than, say, about 50 processes. In that case, you would stripe over a single OST. So it's LFS set stripe minus C1. Um, in that case, you would have, if, if you can imagine just uh, on, a, on a, one of the file systems with 48 OSTs, if you had 48 processes and you had one file per process, and they were striped um, one on each OST, and you could, and somehow you could guarantee that all the OSTs were were different. Then you can see you can get uh, good bandwidth because effectively each file is completely independent. They're not. There, there is some slight dependencies because you are, um, as you, as you are opening. Um, the files, you will uh, access the metadata server, so there is a um, uh, bottleneck there. Uh, but if you don't have too many processes, this isn't a problem. If you have thousands of processes, having one file per process is not going to be the optimum. Um, if you are writing your own code, then you should consider changing to a, a different um, way of, of um, setting up your I.O. Um, as far as stripe size goes, then the the default is probably pretty well optimum. The um, choosing something smaller, so you have to understand that when when uh, uh, your application accesses the uh, the last disk, it goes through a network, so it does some um, it sends messages through that network. Uh, and the size is uh, one, maximum size is one megabyte. So you don't want to have too small a stripe size because this would make the, is, you just waste bandwidth this way. Um, you can choose larger uh, stripe sizes. The recommendation is generally that over about two uh, megabytes, it doesn't really improve uh, performance. Again, you would have to test this in your own particular case. Um, and always let the system decide which OSTs to stripe over. Uh, it, the idea here is that, that if, you, if you make specific choices, then you will very easily put all your files on one set of OSTs, um, which is not ideal from uh, your point of view and also not ideal from Archer's, the whole, the whole Archer um, load balancing across the OSTs. Uh, so um, those are the sort of the technicalities of, of how you would change striping. Um, what you need to do is to work out, well, um, what you could expect, um, whether it's worth changing, doing any changes to, your, to the striping or to your code. Um, and you have to do that. You have to do some measurements on your code. You can run some benchmarks. Um, we'll show, show a slide with, with some benchmark results in a moment. Uh, but basically, because of the, um, because the, because you have various, various um, stages that, that you go through when you, you access the Lustre file system from the, from your particular application. It really does depend on what, on what you're doing in your application. You should benchmark, benchmark that. So what, what, would you, what should you expect as good performance in Archer? Generally, you see uh, 500 megabytes a second per OST. So that's, that's accessing your RAID array as a, a well, as when I said serial limit, that's that's your um, one OST limit. So, if you get that, you're not 
getting parallel. You're not achieving parallel I/O. So if you've if you've written your code and you think you've you've um, arranged it so that you're you're doing parallel I/O, if you're finding that you're getting 500 megabytes a second, you're not. Somehow, some you are just using um, you're writing to a single OST. And because of that, it's always uh, important to benchmark um, your code and quantify the bandwidth. And if you've used the Cray performance tools before, um, there are several settings for when you are um, instrumenting the code and when you're producing the reports. And you can get quite a lot of information from the um, on the I/O. Uh, I think there was a virtual tutorial on performance tools some time ago, or introduction to them. Um, and there are some uh, pages on the uh, Arch in the Archer on the Archer website in the best practice guide, and there are of course the the, the Cray uh, manuals. So that is the best way to um, to benchmark your your own problem and see how much bandwidth you're getting. And also to see whether I.O. is important to your application. If you've, if it's only taking, I don't know, 5% of your, your, total, um, your total job time, you may not bother with, with trying to improve the performance. Uh, it's, that's why it's important to, to find out what, what, uh, what your I.O. Um, load is in your job. Um, the other problem, and, and I suppose this is a problem uh, uh, if you have long jobs that are that you're that you're trying to, to test the eye on, is that um, you will notice that you get a huge variance in the results if you're doing um, runs at different times of day or even within minutes of each other, and that's because unlike uh, the compute nodes which you have to yourself once you've once you've been uh, allocated some compute nodes in a in a job that they're all yours, um, the work file systems are shared, and and um, for some of the file systems there are there are uh, there are, there are jobs that are producing large amounts of I/O, um, and so if you happen to be trying to write or read uh, files at the same time as those, you will get slow access. And if no one else is using it, you will get fast access. Um, so you should, you should always have a look at the best and worst cases. Um, and the other effect that you will notice is there are several layers of caching when you do I/O. So if you're, this is especially obvious when you are, if you were to do say a write and then a read, um, you can get caching. On the compute node, you can get caching in the OSS, um, and so those can make the performance look much higher than it actually is. Um, there's a suggestion to use for benchmarking to use direct I/O, which sh which should bypass all the caches, and that is sort of reasonable, except that um, that gives you, I think that. Uh, underestimates the performance uh, that you will get um, because it it does seem to actually uh, it, well sorry in my experience it seems to 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 um, be much worse than than a case where you remove the effects of caching by um, uh, clearing out the cache in the first place. So. Sorry about that. Um, yep. Yeah, so this isn't actually to do with luster, but it's important because many people get this get this wrong. Um, so when you're running your job, if you're it's usually mostly from when you're producing output to standard out or standard error. Um, if you produce a lot of that, it all goes through app run. So you may think you're writing it out all in parallel, and, and if you look at your output, it will look like poss poss possibly your output's all jumbled up. 
but all those processes go through the, the single app run that's running on the mom node. Um, and if you are, if you've, if you've redirected that to Flash work, then you may think you're doing this all in parallel to Flash work. You're not. It's just going through app run. So you, this can do. This is well. This is three effects. One is um, it's going through app run, so uh, and app runs on the mom, mom node, so you're using up computer time on the mom node, which which can affect other users. Uh, the other is if you if you don't redirect the uh, output, then app run saves the saves the uh, output actually on the server for the batch system, PBS. And at the end of your job, it will write it out to um, uh, standard out. So it will come out in your dot, um, your dot o and job number file. Um, and if you write out of an, a, an awful lot of uh, uh, output, then you can fill up this um, these disks on the on the PBS server, um, and that can also cause problems with the, the bat system. And finally, even if you do all the redirection, um, then you will, if you have lots of say debug statements, um, then that will slow down your uh, your code. So just remember to remove any of these print statements when you're benchmarking, or when, or especially when you're running your simulations properly. Um, so there are some um, particular cases that um, that we've noticed just uh, from from queries in the help desk and, and tests we've made. Um, so this is one. This is an example of what happens if you have large numbers of files. Um, so you can see the quotes. Uh, the, for a particular users, user, he was writing out 36,000 small files um, and using the standard striping for of uh, four stripes of file. Uh, setting that to one reduced the output time, sorry, the read time um, from two hours to six minutes. So it's uh, a considerable change. That's 12, 10, 12 times faster. Um, so as you can see, they were quite small files. Um, they were uh, separate files from separate processes. Oh, sorry, this is setting parallel striping to the maximum um, to give best performance. But uh, as I pointed out earlier, every time you're reading it, it's going to have to check, for each file, it's going to have to check all 48 OSTs. Um, to work out the file size so that it can do its read. So in this case, e more stripes did not mean better performance. So what happens if you're doing, again, this is for a large number of files. This is uh, a, a change in, this is just doing a serial tar operation. Um, so this is something you might do at the end of your, of your simulations. Um, so in the case where there were, so this is 5,000 files and more, um, slightly larger. Um, if you created a tar file, if you striped them with overall the OSTs, um, took about 30 minutes. If you used the standard uh, four OST stripe count, it took similar amount of times. And if you striped it over one, it dropped it down to 18 minutes. So it's about a 40% reduction um, in operation time between 48 stripes and one stripe. So again, um, sometimes choosing the correct number of stripes is not, not obvious. Um, but just as a comment that um, if you have this number of files, you will still get bottlenecks at the MDS. You will reduce the bottlenecks at the OSTs, but you will still um, have bottlenecks at the MDS. So in general, we don't recommend large numbers of small files. Um, at the other extreme, um, Dominic uh, Sloan-Murphy did some 
uh, performance tests on a single file. Um, so these, this is a, a benchmark uh, case. Um, and this is looking at the, the, the effect of stripe count uh, between stripe count 1, stripe count 4, which is the default, and stripe count 48, which is the maximum on the file system that's used. Um, and this used MPIO, which is a, um, as you may guess from the name, a uh, IO uh, through uh, an provided an IO library provided um, with the MPI uh, library. Uh, so it's, it is designed for uh, parallel IO. Um, and I seem to have lost my yes. So a single file, multiple writers and writing uh, a quarter of a gigabyte per writer. So as the number of processes, number of cores, number of processes increases, the, the file size increases. Um, so you can see if we stripe it uh, with just one stripe, it with one stripe, we get consistently about 500 uh, megabytes a second um, write speed uh, for a variety of, of numbers of processes. So that's as we expect, that's the serial um, speed. If you have four stripes, then we get a peak of about 1,500 uh, megabytes a second, and that, but then it drops off as you have larger numbers of, of processes. So there is, so as you can see, there is some um, optimum here uh, of choosing stripe count to match your number of processes. Uh, but then, as you go to the maximum stripe count, it's all apart from the smallest number of processes. It's all pretty consistent at about seven, about 3,500 um, megabytes a second. So you can see that changing the stripe counts by uh, from one to the maximum has increased your um, I.O. bandwidth by a factor of seven. So it is useful uh, even if you have, even if you have a code which you have no control over, so one of the uh, centrally installed codes, for example, then it's worth trying different stripe sizes to see if you can improve your uh, performance, but again, you should you should um, do some performance tests on this first um, to see what whether it's actually worth doing this and, and what the optimum is. Um, so this is almost the end of the the talk. Uh, just a comment about parallel I/O libraries. Um, if you using last it's sort of the basis for getting good um, parallel I/O performance, but you have to have uh, you have to have your application um, set up properly as well. And if you're writing your own code, we strongly encourage you to use a library to handle I/O rather than use standard POSIX I/O. So not using just um, open, read, write, and close. Um, they, the the library will be more portable and will be better optimized than than anything you can produce yourself. I mean, in general, um, and the three that come to mind, uh, sort of in lev in in increasing level of um, abstraction or sophistication, are MPIO, which is the the, the basic. Um, I/O library that you would use. Uh, HDF5 uh, has parallel I/O capabilities, which are built on top of MPIO. And NetCDF, uh, NetCDF for, for NetCDF4 files, um, has parallel I/O capability, which is built on HDF5, which is built on MPIO. There are also there's also a package called Parallel NetCDF, which is um, which also does parallel I/O for NetCDF, but in a slightly different way. So it's uh, up to you which one of these two you would use for NetCDF five. Um, and the, these are comprehensive solutions; they're fully supported in Archer. Um, and if you're developing your own code, um, or you are persuasive enough um, for the developers of, of other codes. Then you could ask them to implement um, parallel I/O and suggest those uh, libraries. 
So in summary, um, on on a Luster file system like uh, slash work and Archer, files are striped over multiple OSTs. You should tune Luster to the application file usage pattern. More stripes are not always better, um, and you really need to have to to benchmark your code to to choose a good uh, stripe count and stripe size setting. Um, but be aware that uh, file system contention by other users can cause huge variance in results. Um, and if you're designing your own programs, then always investigate the available libraries. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. So just to conclude, there are some links and references. Um, there's some details in the Archer Best Practice Guide. Um, the uh, Cray have uh, uh, a guide for managing Luster file systems on, on Cray systems. Most of this is for, um, much of this is of interest to uh, the systems on the Cray team, uh, but there's some interesting bits in there which you can, which you can um, use to, to, to make some uh, choices for, your, for how you're going to tune uh, striping. Um, the luster, um, there seem to be two or three different uh, organizations dealing with luster, but the, the sort of base, the uh, official manual is in this location. Uh, and we have on R2, we have luster 2.5 now. Um, so I think in this, in this link, there's, uh, I think all the manuals, 2.x, I think, is, is the one you, you will want. Um, there are some, and there's some links here to uh, where HDF5 and NetCDF um, information can be uh, obtained. The MPIIO, um, the standard place to look would, would be the MPIIO uh, uh, standard. Uh, it's not so easy to read through, so but there are some. There are several books which um, give an introduction to uh, how to use MPIO. And that is the end of the uh, of the virtual tutorial. So if you have any questions, you can either um, put up your hand and uh, we switch on the talk, or you can type into the chat. No questions. Do settings, oh, I can't read that. Do settings need to be set for, so as soon as I'm asking, do settings need to be set for file reading? as well as writing. Y yes. Well, the, the settings are um, applied to whether you're reading or writing. Generally, the, the, um, it's it, reading, it does seem that reading is less, um, certainly if you get the striping wrong when you're writing, that seems to be slower seems to make more of an effect than for, for reading. Um, but yes, if you set the striping, that's for any access to the file. So if there are there any more questions, if there aren't any, then uh, we will finish the tutorial. Just to note that um, the slides will be available on the Archer webpage um, in a short while. 
um, and there will be a recording of the session as well available uh, on the uh, Archer website in the training section. Um, and I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much for attending and I hope it was useful. Goodbye.